would you take revenge against your greatest enemy? Or perhaps enemy is too strong a word. And is someone who's just so annoying that you'd like to see them disappear. In one of Edgar Allan Poe's most famous stories, will inhabit the mind of a monstrous man bent on vengeance. After reading the tale, we'll explore what writers can learn about the craft from this story. And now, The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could. But when he ventured upon insults, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato. Although in other regards, he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connorship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity, to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmery, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How? said he. Amontillado, a pipe? Impossible. And in the middle of carnival? I have my doubts, I replied. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You are not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado! And I must satisfy them. Amontillado! As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell Lucchese me- Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchese, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, and putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a rock allure closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood together upon the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, he said. It is farther on, said I. But observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. <clears throat> Nitre? he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. 
How long have you had that cough? <coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. <coughs> it is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is the case- Enough, he said. The cough's a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. But you should use all proper caution. A draft of this Medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mould. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly, while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot, dear, and a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune la cassette. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the madoc. We had passed through long walls of piled skeletons, with cask and puncheons intermingling, into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we'll go back here, it is too late. Your cough, it is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first, another draught of the Medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A mason. A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. A sign. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my rock allure. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior crypt or recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchese, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. 
Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was much too astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado! ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied. The Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I seized my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chain form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment, I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed, I aided, I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight. My task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> a very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo, <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting us at the palazzo, the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! No answer. I called again, Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace, requia Scott. I've read this story many, many times, and I notice something new with each reading. First, let's touch on the story's background and historical context. The Cask of Amontillado was published in 1846. Poe was well into his literary career when the story was published, having already sold The Raven and The Telltale Heart not long before. Poe is credited with being the father of detective fiction, and the Edgar Award is now given to authors of distinguished mystery fiction. The Cask of Amontillado is a story that showcases the perpetrator of a crime, rather than a victim or heroic detective. The mystery lies in what the narrator's revenge will entail, and what drove him to such madness. At the time of writing the story, Poe had a feud with fellow author Thomas Dunn English, 
English created a caricature of Poe as a drunkard in one of his novels. And in revenge, Poe modeled Fortunato after his enemy, and then buried him alive. As the saying goes, don't piss off a writer, they'll put you in their book, and then they will kill you. The historical context can help us make sense of certain details. Immurement is a form of imprisonment or execution, where a person is trapped inside a space with no exits, which is obviously what happens to Fortunato. The fear of being buried alive was a common one in the 19th century, since physicians of the era had a harder time distinguishing between a comatose state and actual death. Poe played on that fear most famously in his short stories The Premature Burial and The Fall of the House of Usher. Some safety coffins had a bell that could be rung from the inside using a rope. The bell on Fortunato's jester costume references that ringing ironically, since the person hearing his desperate chimes has little desire to save him. Montiato is obviously another important element, given it's in the story's title. According to the website Sherry Notes, Montiato was a type of sherry, one in the style of Mantilla, Spain, which is a lighter wine. They elaborate, in any case, Amontillado was considered an exclusive wine, which is why Montresor is worried he may have paid the price of Amontillado for a cask of regular sherry. The cask of Amontillado deserves to be highlighted as the title, because it's the catalyst for the story, as the pretense Montresor uses to draw Fortunato into the catacombs. It also brings to mind the word casket. That's one of Poe's many clever touches. The cask of Amontillado can teach writers a lot about having narrative focus, using purposeful details, building suspense, writing from a murderer's perspective, and leaving room for mystery. Number one, narrative focus. Narrative focus is especially important in short stories, as you have to present a cohesive narrative in a smaller number of words. This often means focusing on one point of conflict and limiting the number of characters. Here, we have only two characters, the plot is fairly straightforward. A man leads his frenemy underground and kills him. The cask of Amontillado is on the shorter side, even by short story standards, wrapping up under 2400 words, proving how much can be accomplished in a few pages. We can outline the narrative structure using a standard plot graph. Exposition and Conflict Montresor opens by saying, The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. From that very first sentence, the reader knows he has ulterior motives when he tells his friend about the wine. We're about 650 words into the story at this point, the 27% mark. Rising Action They travel into the catacombs beneath Montresor's house, commenting on their surroundings and Montresor's family. We get a sense of atmosphere and suspense, because we know something bad is going to happen. There are some hints about why he's committing this act of revenge. This is an additional 900 words or so, 65% of the way through the story. Climax. Montresor chains Fortunato to the wall. He then mortars him in, with Fortunato hoping it's all a joke. This takes 720 words, bringing us to the 95% mark. Falling action resolution. The last paragraph ties up the story in around 80 words, the final 5%. The concluding sentences let us know what happened after Montresor killed Fortunato. Did he get caught? Nope. Did Montresor regret it? Probably not. Not all stories will hit these points at the same percentage marks, but we can see how Poe presents a clear narrative arc. Number two, purposeful details. When you examine the devil in the details, you can tell that Poe's choice of setting, imagery, and dialogue all serve to generate suspense. The story takes place during carnival season, a time when people abandon social order and masquerade as someone they're not. But the two characters' outfits exaggerate their core qualities. Fortunato is wearing a jester hat. He's literally dressed as a fool, with the tinkling bells and his drunkenness befitting how annoying Montresor finds him. Montresor himself is wearing an ominous black silk mask. The dark, quiet catacombs are in direct contrast to the colorful party going on above, as if they're descending into hell itself. What's more, there's immense irony in Fortunato's name, which means the fortunate one. Montresor's family motto and coat of arms also foreshadow his revenge plot. The motto, Nemo me impune la cassit, translates to, No one attacks me with impunity. In his coat of arms, the foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel, just as Montresor is the foot crushing the irritating snake that is Fortunato. 
Writer on eNotes observes, The cask of Amontillado is one of the clearest examples of Poe's theory of the unity of the short story, for every detail in the story contributes to the overall ironic effect. Poe called this unity of effect, and he wrote about the concept in an essay entitled The Philosophy of Composition, which dissects his process for writing poetry, particularly The Raven. In the whole composition, there should be no word written of which the tendency, direct or indirect, is not to the one pre-established design. And by such means, with such care and skill, a picture is at length painted, which leaves in the mind of him who contemplates it with a kindred art, a sense of the fullest satisfaction. Poe seemed to know what emotional effect he wanted the story to have. So the setting, dialogue, and character details all contribute to a single purpose, that of evoking dreadful irony. The important thing is that Poe never points out his own cleverness. He adds in foreshadowing and trusts that the reader is smart enough to figure it out for themselves. For instance, when Montresor first begins talking to Fortunato, he tells him, As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. But Fortunato cuts him off to attest, Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. This exchange is a calculated move on Montresor's part, who further strokes Fortunato's ego by adding, And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. He already knew that Fortunato thought Lucchese a lesser connoisseur, and so he emotionally manipulates Fortunato by playing on his desire to prove he's better than his rival. Montresor identified pride as his friend's weakness, and pride is ultimately what leads to Fortunato's demise. Poe could have had Montresor internally state something like, But I only mentioned the other wine connoisseur to play on Fortunato's ego and ensure he followed me to the catacombs, at risk of me calling upon his rival's expertise. Instead, Poe lets the dialogue speak for itself, with Montresor's intentions being implied. Number 3. Building Suspense Poe's unity of effect creates an atmosphere of dread and anticipation. In this story, the characters' conversation topics contribute to building that suspense. The reader knows Montresor is plotting revenge against Fortunato, but not what exactly he plans to do or why. This knowledge imbues the dialogue with a strong subtext, a hidden double meaning behind Montresor's words. The E Notes writer points out how Montresor secretly taunts Fortunato in the dialogue, using verbal irony. For example, when Fortunato says he will not die of a cough, Montresor knowingly replies, True, true. When Fortunato drinks a toast to the dead lying in the catacombs around them, Montresor ironically drinks to Fortunato's long life. When Fortunato makes a gesture indicating that he is a member of the secret society of Masons, Montresor claims that he is also, and proves it by revealing a trowel, the sign of his plot to wall up Fortunato. So, Montresor's replies sound innocent enough on the surface, but given what we know about his intentions, they take on the tone of a veiled threat. The essence of suspense is the intense feeling of uncertainty as you wait for the outcome of an event. Here, the dialogue is a constant reminder of the revenge to come. Number 4. A Murderer's Perspective The story is told from the perspective of a first-person unreliable narrator, but two sentences in particular change how we view the story. In the second sentence, Montresor addresses a specific person, saying, you who so well know the nature of my soul. And in the second to last sentence, he states, For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them, referring to Fortunato's remains. These sentences suggest that Montresor is recounting this story to someone close to him, 50 years after the murder. It's hard to tell how Montresor feels about killing Fortunato in retrospect. His last sentence declares, In pace requiescat, or rest in peace. But is his tone genuine or sarcastic? There's almost a sense of guilt at the very end as Montresor seals up the bricks. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. Montresor takes care to say it's the catacombs making him feel that way. But if our murderer is an unreliable narrator, can we trust what he tells us about his feelings? Montresor's insistence that he feels no guilt connects to his definition of the perfect revenge at the beginning of his tale. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. 
Montresor succeeds in punishing Fortunato with impunity, in that he never faced the legal consequences of his crime. The third sentence implies that Montresor wanted Fortunato to know that this was a punishment, as well as who is responsible for his death, rather than hiring someone else to assassinate him in a dark alley or something. But the ambiguity in the phrase, when retribution overtakes its redresser, could mean that Montresor has not truly achieved revenge if he feels even a twinge of regret. In his mind, revenge is only a success if he faces no suffering or penalty for his actions. He doesn't dare admit to any feelings of guilt, even when his heart grows sick as he listens to the jingling of Fortunato's bells. Perhaps because admitting regret means that retribution has overtaken him. Writing from the perspective of an unreliable narrator allows Poe to create emotional ambiguity, making Montresor feel more complex. Our characters might not recognize certain truths about themselves. Number 5. Room for Mystery The ending leaves Montresor's motives a mystery. Although Montresor mentions bearing a thousand offenses from Fortunato, the slights are never specified. Maybe Fortunato was just an annoying person who constantly bragged about his social status and expertise. We don't know if the punishment was equal to the crime, and we only have the narrator's word to go on. There is a sense of horror in the fact that somebody could kill you over petty differences. In most mystery novels, the killer not having a clear motivation might be unsatisfying, but that lack of knowledge is what adds to the horror in the story. In real life, we're obsessed with motives. We want to know why someone would murder someone else. Our storytelling brains have an intense desire for cause and effect. We want to create a narrative where behind every reaction is an action that caused it, that could be controlled to prevent future crimes. If a man is abusive, perhaps he's that way because his father was abusive. Or maybe a woman grew up in a cult with no control over her life, so now she controls others. In this story, the absence of an understandable motivation is more disturbing than if Montresor had had a particular reason for killing Fortunato. It's that uncertainty that's terrifying. How can we protect ourselves from that type of murderous rage when we don't know the cause? In the words of horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. The dark beauty of the cask of Amontillado lies in the horror of uncertainty. As a writing exercise, try crafting a story where the reader knows a secret another character doesn't. Yet. Fill your dialogue with subtext, where one character is secretly manipulating and taunting the other. Make your readers feel a sense of anticipation as they wait for the unwitting character to discover the truth. A big thank you thank you to Shelley Costa Bloomfield for reviewing my script for this video. She's the author of The Everything Guide to Edgar Allan Poe, as well as the Val Cameron and Italian Restaurant Mystery series. There are a lot of wonderful graphic novel adaptations of Poe's works, and in this video I've featured ones by Gareth Hines, Manga Classics, and Graphic Classics illustrated by Pedro Lopez. If you want to read the text version, I recommend Poe's Stories, which is linked in the description. And to Edgar Allan Poe, I say, in pake requiescat. What are your thoughts on this story? Rant and rave in the comments. Whatever you do, keep writing.